All right, good afternoon, church. A big welcome to you wherever you may be watching from today, whether it be your lounge room or your bedroom or even your kitchen. Uh, I just want to extend a happy Father's Day to all the dads out there. I was just uh, reflecting this week and I remembered earlier this year the you know, fantastic Mother's Day program we got to put on and then celebrate and honour our mums and then we get to Father's Day and we don't get to do as much. So I, I'm going to keep the message nice, short and simple and I hope that you guys can spend time together as a family. Love on your dads, honour your dads and I hope dads you get a great gift, a great bit of love tomorrow. Um, I just want to thank you for the role that you play in all of our lives, in shaping, moulding and guiding us. You have such an important role to play in the lives of so many people. And I just love this little video that the, the skit guys put together um, of the role and the impact dads have. So we're just going to play it short uh, just now. So tune in. When you're a dad, you have to play a lot of roles. Hey, 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 don't eat that. Don't tap on the brain. Okay, oh, Lordy. All right. Oh, you're good. Take, take a left, turn left, turn left, turn left. When a man loves a woman, he... Honey! All righty, sweetie. This time I want you to concentrate and focus on the ball. You got this. Sweetie, your date's here. Two weeks, no TV, no phone. This is my door in my house. I told you not to slam it. You get the door back when I say you get the door back. I told you before, don't you slam the door in my house. I told you. Hey, knock it off. Don't let me turn this car around. I'll do it. What are you wearing? No, I, you're not going anywhere looking like that. Go on back upstairs and put some clothes on. Okay. Oh! Got it. Ooh, sweetie, open the door. Get the door. Get the door. Get the door. Get the door. Open the door. Open the door, sweetie. Open. Bye. And Jesus steps in and stops everybody before they start throwing the rocks. And he says, let he who's without sin throw the first stone. You do all of this knowing that one day you will get fired because we all get fired. But by the grace of God, you might get hired back to be a consultant. Hey, sweetie. What's up? Thank you, dads, for all the different roles that you can play in our lives in, in shaping us, in molding us, in guiding us, in instructing us, in disciplining us. Uh, we just thank you for all those different roles that you play in shaping us and helping become the people we are today. Um, but when you think of the word dad, what comes to your mind? When you think of your dad, what comes to mind? You know, we can think of all those terrible or wonderful dad jokes that we get. Uh, we can think of dad bods. I think everyone's got a dad bod after COVID-19. Um, dad jeans. Or we love dad's wallet when we just need to go buy something. We're getting a bit more serious what about dad's protection or dad's love or dad's wisdom. Dads can play such an important role in our life. And they teach us an important thing of our father in heaven the ultimate dad, the ultimate guide that we could ever need. Um, and so today I just want to reflect a little bit on fathers and what we can learn from our father in heaven for our lives. Um, but before I dig into that, I wanted to get some of our new dads from church to reflect on the question, what does it mean to be a dad to them? Their life has changed dramatically. Um, so we've put a little video together of a couple of our new dads just reflecting on what it means to be a dad. And so hopefully that comes up in the screen in just a second. When I'm recording this video, I'm a dad for two months, two weeks and one day. And I think that this is a great privilege. And this is amazing how beautifully God created us. I'm also thinking about the responsibility uh, that it's in front of me. I'm also thinking about the protection that I would like to do everything that it's only possible to, pro to protect my little boy. I'm also thinking that I'm super happy, joyful, and I'm super proud to be a dad. And also thinking that this is my dream come true. And even when now sometimes, maybe not even sometimes, I need to wake up at 3 a.m. in the morning to change the nappy, and I'm waking up to be maybe pee by my son, it doesn't matter because I love him so much. 
and it doesn't matter because when he will give me this smile that you can see now on the screen everything simply doesn't matter this is a great privilege and I'm super grateful to be a dad and this is really amazing to be a dad it means to um, um, be there for Milo um, support him love him and care for him um, also to be a good role model for him I think that's important and as well spend a lot of quality time with him um, maybe hopefully in the future build a lot of Lego together I think it means to reprioritize all my life to put my loved ones first whether it's my daughter or my wife because it's we all in this together oh. and I'm um, even though it's not easy I'm loving every minute of that Tak? Kochasz tatusia? Kochasz tatusia? Tata! Tata! Bye bye! Anna! Mama! Mama! Thank you for those videos, dads, and I hope that you enjoy the journey ahead of you. Um, but I just want to reflect on, on what scripture has to teach us about fathers. Um, and what scripture teaches us about God, our Father. See, in the Bible, there's many different terms that describe who God is. But I think one of the most significant ways um, that God is described is, is God the Father. Uh, and it signifies such uh, an important understanding of who God is and how he relates to his people and how we can look at God. Uh, this term in scripture is, is referred to as Abba, Father. And Abba in Aramaic simply just means father. But it's a term that was used to express affection, confidence, and trust. It signifies close and intimate relationship between father and child. And it, and it signifies deep trust. And the scriptures point that's the, the trust that we need to have in, in our father in heaven. There's a couple times it comes across in scripture. In Mark chapter 14, Jesus addresses um, God as Abba, Father, in his prayer in Gethsemane. In Romans 8, Paul describes that we are to cry out, Abba, Father. And in Galatians 4, 6, it's there as well. But it, it signifies just the type of relationship that God desires to have with us. You know, he's not a, a far-off God. He's not a distant God. He's not a dormant God. But he's a God who wants to be active and involved and in, in, in the lives of his children. He wants to be involved in all of our lives. You know, when Jesus taught his disciples to pray in the Sermon on the Mount, he, he begins with, our Father in heaven. And I think there's a lot of truth in, in those two words alone. You know, this holy, righteous God, this all-powerful being who created all that we know, encourages us to call him Father. What a privilege that is of ours. That this all-powerful God desires a close, intimate relationship with us. With us mere humans. And it's crazy. Um, Tim Keller sort of points out the significance. He, um, he says, The only person who dares wake up a king at 3 a.m. for a glass of water is a child. We have that kind of access with God. And so I just want to remind you of our Father, our, our God who looks dearly upon us. And so I just want to reflect on, on just a small portion in Scripture today, on, on what we can learn about God and what that means for us, and then how we can relate as a church, not only for the dads out there to their kids, but for all of us. Um, in Luke chapter 3, we come to Jesus' baptism. And I just got two short verses here that I'm going to reflect on. When all the people were being baptized, Jesus was baptized too. And as he was praying, heaven was opened, and the Holy Spirit descended on him in bodily form like a dove. And a voice from heaven shouted out, You are my son, whom I love, and with you I am well pleased. I think that's just such a, a beautiful verse in Scripture. A beautiful picture that we get there of the relationship that God the Father shares with Jesus and that God the Father shares with us too. 
And so I think we learn a couple of things just from this little text alone. But I think we learn that God is present. God is active. God is involved and engaged. Right here from the get-go, we see that God is already involved here. He's not far away. He's not removed. He hasn't, he hasn't left, left it to its own devices. Um, and all throughout Scripture, we see that God is a present God. God is someone who wants to be involved in our life. All throughout the Old Testament, God desired to be with his people. The whole idea of the sanctuary in the Old Testament was so that God could dwell with his people. The idea of Sabbath was so that God could have time with Adam and Eve and with the rest of humanity. And so we need to realize and we need to recognize that God wants to be active, involved, and engaged in our own life. And sometimes it's hard to realize. Sometimes it's hard to see God working in our life, especially in in this moment, especially in the hardships. But I think we need to take time to sit down and to reflect and look at where God is working. God is involved in our lives. And if we can't see him right here in the present, How about we reflect on the past? How has God been with us before? I love um, in in the David and Goliath battle, when David's coming up to fight Goliath, he he can recount how God has worked in the past. He, He says that, you know, God helped me with the bear, with the lion, with the wolf. God was there in the past. And as I'm going to face Goliath, I know God's going to be with me right now. And so if we want to know that God's active and involved, look in the life Look in the past life or talk to each other. That's why I think it's so important that we share stories of of how God has worked in our week, what God is doing in our lives, because we can learn and be encouraged by the stories from each other. But if we learn that God is present, active and involved in our life, then I think we also need to be active, involved and engaged in the lives of others, especially as um, parents. We need to be present in the life of our kids Because there's a saying, you know, kids spell love like this, T-I-M-E, time, the amount of time you spend with them. And no amount of of presence, no amount of gifts can make up for a lack of presence. Being in the lives of others, especially of of our kids, is so important. And there was this story uh, a famous attorney wrote, the greatest gift I ever received from my dad was a box. And in that box was a note saying, son, I'm giving you 365 hours, an hour after dinner every day. My dad kept his promise and my dad renewed that promise year after year. He spent countless hours with me. I stand here as the result of his time. By contrast, there was another story that went like this. Do you remember your father? Asked the judge sternly. That father you have disgraced. The prisoner answered, I remember him perfectly. When I went to him as a boy for advice and companionship, he would look up at, from his book, from his book of law and trust, turn to the boy and say, run away, boy, for I am busy. My father finished his book, and here I am as a result. The amount of time that we spend with kids, the amount of time we spend with each other is important. I remember reading uh, this book in, in, that talked about how we spend our time and, and how kids see our time. And there was this startling quote that, that went something along the lines of, you know, an alcoholic and a workaholic is no different to the kid. The kid, both dads are away from home. And th- that hit me, you know, we need to be able to spend that time. It's so, so important and so, so valuable. And if we learn that God is present in our lives, then we need to be present in the lives of others. And so I want to encourage you today to use this time. I know we're in lockdown, but family time matters. Discipleship can start in the home, and I hope that we can encourage you to disciple at home to your family. Secondly, I, I think we learn another thing about God in this text here that God speaks tenderly and affirmingly, especially here when, he, when you know, he comes and he says, you are my beloved son. With you, I am well pleased. I just love that. That, you know, this is sort of the first sort of instance that we see of Jesus. Jesus hasn't done anything yet. He hasn't gone out and, and performed all the miracles. He hasn't gone out and done all the amazing teachings and all the amazing things. But right here from the get-go, 
God says, with you, I am well pleased. Because it's not about our doing, it's not about our works, it's about who God is and what he thinks of us. And so God speaks affirmingly, God speaks tenderly, God speaks kindly to us. So how do you think God views you? How do you think God sees you? Do you see God as this mean sort of judge with his arms crossed, looking down upon you, judging everything that you do? Or do you see him as this kind, loving, gracious father? You know, I love the picture that we get in Luke 15, and often we call this story the story of the prodigal son, but this story isn't about the son, it's more about the love and the grace that the father shows. And that's what we get from God the Father. Big, wide open arms, words of comfort, words of words of tenderness. Jesus looks at us and says the, says the same, with you I am well pleased. And I think gentle, kind, affirming words really matter. Um, you know, I remember at my old church, something that we did growing up is, you know, when it came to, to birthdays, we would get people up the front and we would just affirm them. We would just love on them. We would sometimes spend 5, 10, 15 minutes. Sometimes it would take up a majority of the sermon time when we were just affirming people, speaking life into them. And we'd pray for them. You know, so often we just save affirming words for the birthdays, or often we save affirming words at, at somebody's funeral. But I think people need to hear those words before they're dead. And so I want to encourage us, hey, let's be affirming with each other. Let's speak um, words of encouragement, words of hope. Uplift people. You know, words matter. Proverbs reminds us the power in words. In Proverbs 15, it says, a gentle answer deflects anger. But harsh words make tempers flare. Or later on in 15.4 it says, Gentle words are a tree of life, but a deceitful tongue crushes the spirit. I love this one in chapter 16. Kind words are like honey, sweet to the soul and healthy for the body. Let's firm each other, but let's know that God affirms us. Reflect on, on, on Scripture. Meditate on the words that we have and the encouraging words God speaks to us of how he views us, of how he sees us. You know, in Ephesians chapter 2, he reminds us that we are his, his artwork or his masterpiece. Well, the Psalms remind us that we are fearfully and wonderfully made. Or well, Paul reminds us of, of our identity in Christ. Again and again, he uses this phrase, in Christ, I am in Christ, I am in Christ. And so when God looks at us, he doesn't see sin, he doesn't see shame, he doesn't see guilt, he doesn't see condemnation, he sees Jesus, whom he is well pleased with. Our words matter. And you know, so often we can say the words, I'm proud of you, I'm proud of you, but if we only say the words, I'm proud of you, um, when something good is done, then attached with that can be almost a bit of legalism and Pharisaic nature. Because, okay, I'm only good, they're only proud of me when I do good things. But no, no, no. I might not be proud of what you did, but I'm proud of who you are. And so I think we need to be affirming. We need to speak hope and energy and life into people and know that that's how God looks at us too. I think another thing that we learn, not only from this text, but from all the scriptures, is that God is a loving God. And I think we regularly need to remind ourselves of God's love for us. It's so easy just to, oh, yep, God loves us. Oh, yep, God loves us. But no, that's the key. That's the cornerstone of everything, God's love for humanity. You know, there was a famous theologian who read many books, who wrote many books and many articles and preached many lectures and many sermons. And, and someone came to him and asked, okay, after all your reading, after everything that you've seen and spoken about, what's your, what's your takeaway? And he just said, Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. And I think that's the simple truth of everything in Scripture. That we are loved beyond all measure. We are loved with beyond all doubt. And there's this unconditional love that I, I'm assuming parents, you must now be feeling as you show it to your kids. That despite what they do, despite their mess ups and their flaws, that you still love them. And we get a glimpse of what God's love is like for us, that despite our flaws, despite our imperfections, despite what we may do, God still loves us. 
You know, I was listening to this pastor, and he had his, this saying with his children. And he taught them time and time again. He taught them this. He said, I love you when you're good. I love you when you're naughty. I love you all the time. And I think we need to remember God's unconditional love for us too. It's not based on our performance. It's not based on our good work. It's not based on what we do do or don't do, but it's based on God himself and his deep love for us. Time and time again in the scriptures, we see God's deep love, especially in the Old Testament, despite their waywardness, despite the, the choices they made, we're reminded again and again. Nehemiah chapter 9, verse 17 says, You are a God ready to forgive, gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and did not forsake them. Rosiah 54.10 says, For the mountains may depart, the hills be removed, but my steadfast love shall not depart from you. And my covenant of peace shall not be removed from you, says the Lord, who has compassion on you. Well, Jeremiah 31.3 says, The Lord appeared to us in the past, saying, I have loved you with an everlasting love. I have drawn you with unfailing kindness. Or have you ever read the book of Hosea? talks about how unfaithful Israel has been. But despite all of that, God's faithfulness and God's deep love for his people. On Romans 5, we're reminded God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. And so throughout the scripture, we learn so much about God the Father. But even from the simple words that I read in Luke chapter 3, we learn that God is active and involved we see that God speaks tenderly and kindly and affirming. And we see that time and time again that God is loving. And I think as, as we reflect on this Father's love, that we in turn need to display and need to show that Father's love. Because we live in a world that is broken. We live in a world that is sinful. We live in a world where even our dads are not perfect. But we have a Father in heaven who is perfect. And I think we, as a church, as a community, we need to reflect that love to each other. Because many grow up in a broken home. Many do grow up without dads. You know, for myself, it was the, the spiritual fathers that I had in church that helped me get to where I am today. And so as a church, we need to not only understand, see and experience God's love, but share God's love with others. Because we have a world that needs it. We need to be a church that is, that is a father figure to the fatherless. We need to stand up and to protect because the community around us is hurting and is broken. There is always need for the gospel. You know, I had the privilege of when I was studying, I worked at a, as a chaplain in a, just a primary school. And it was a great little gig. Um, but in that school, there were kids that came from a broken home. At such a young age, four, five, six, and they're already in a, in a split family home where they don't see dad's love, where they don't see dad's care, where they don't see dad's protection. But I had an important role to play of being a positive male role model in the lives of those kids. And I don't know what difference it made. I don't know the seeds that were sown, but I, I could see that it made a difference. And so we as a church need to take that responsibility. We as a church need to be a reflection of God's love because there are many who grow up in homes without that love, without that kindness, without that tenderness. And we need to give them a better picture of who God is. So who can we be a father figure to? Who can we show God's love and compassion to? I just want to finish with some lyrics. As I was, I was thinking about all of this this week, I just came across you know, a, a song that, that really means a lot to me, and it talks about, and it, it's titled, How Deep the Father's Love Is. And so I just want to reflect on the lyrics here. It says, How deep the Father's love for us, how vast beyond all measure, that he would give his only son to make a wretch his treasure. How great the pain of searing loss, the Father turns his face away, as wounds which marred the chosen one bring many sons to glory. Behold the man upon a cross, my sin upon his shoulders. Ashamed, I hear my mocking voice call out among the scoffers. It was my sin that held him there until it was accomplished. His dying breath has brought me life. I know that it is finished. I will not boast in anything 
no gifts, no power, no wisdom, but I will boast in Jesus Christ, his death and resurrection. Why should I gain from his reward? I cannot give an answer. But this I know with all my heart, his wounds have paid my ransom. How deep the Father's love for us. I think that's a beautiful song. And so I want to encourage you later today to, to listen to it, to sit down, close your eyes and, and think upon the words there. But just know how deep the Father's love is for us. And I hope that we can reflect that. So let me just pray. Father God, we thank you for this day that you've given us, for this life that you've given us. Thank you that we can still stay in touch uh, via technology, that we can still dig into your word. And Lord, I pray for each and every person in our church, each and every person watching, that we can experience your love, that we can acknowledge your love, that we can be changed and transformed by your love too. Help us never to forget it and how impactful it is in our lives. Thank you for the grace, the love, the mercy that you've shown and that we can't even begin to understand. And so I pray that we can reflect that love, that we can be your, um, your hands and feet in this community, in this world, and we can show what your love is like to those who have no idea. So fill us with your love. Fill us with your, your, um, your Holy Spirit. And may we reflect that to the people around us. We thank you for everything, Jesus. Amen. Church, I hope you have enjoyed this little program that we've put together. Dads, I hope you have an amazing day tomorrow and that you are spoilt, breakfast and bread, lots of presents. But I hope that you have an amazing weekend. Have an amazing week. If you need somebody to talk to, I'm always here. So stay safe and be blessed. And we will see you again soon. Take care, church. Mm -hmm.